This is Thursday, January 9th, 2014. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Thurston Hammer. Welcome, Thurston. Glad to be here. Okay, may I ask when you were born? I was born February 5th, 1923. And where were you born? Lexington, Massachusetts. And where do you currently live? I live in Concord, Massachusetts. What is your marital status? I have a wife, three children, eight grandchildren, and a great-granddaughter. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. What was Lexington like growing up? Lexington was a very historical town, as you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in a home that belonged to a doctor who actually served in the revolution treating patients, Dr. Fisk, and uh, walking to school every Mm -hmm. Today I would go by the, the green where the battle took place in the beginning. Wow. Yeah, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Were you an only child? No, I had uh, three brothers and a sister. Mm -hmm. And uh, what did your parents do? Uh, my mother was a homemaker mm -hmm. and my father was in the life insurance business in Boston. Okay. And you did you go to public school? I went to Lexington High School through the sophomore year, and then I transferred to Andover, Phillips Academy, and spent three years there getting out in uh, June of 1942. Mm -hmm. And you always had this interest in history? Always. Okay. In fact, even today, I work part-time at Old Sturbridge Village out in uh, the western part of the state. I'm a historical interpreter there, mm. so I get to use history there, too. Nice. Yeah. So uh, you were at Andover when Pearl Harbor was attacked. That's right. In fact, my oldest brother was on a destroyer at Pearl Harbor uh, when it was attacked by the Japanese. He was mm -hmm. on, the, on the beach, but he got back to his ship and got onto his destroyer, and he served in just about every major battle in the Pacific up to and including Okinawa. Wow. And what was your brother's name? Alec, A-L-E-X, Alec Hammer, Jr. Mm-hmm. And is he still with us? No, all of my siblings are gone, mm -hmm. except me. Okay. <clears throat> Where and when did you join the military? Uh, I joined the military in the summer of 1943. I left Andover and went to Yale. I was admitted to Yale. And the V-12 Navy program started in July of 43 for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was one of the reasons that I stayed in college, would have that program. Mm -hmm. What the program did was give you probably a year and a half of uh, training and regular college work, and then you'd transfer it to a midshipman school, which I did. I went to Notre Dame for 90 days and got mm -hmm. a commission in 1944. Okay. So before um, you were still in Yale, and be but before the V-12 program, uh, the years like uh, in 1942, 43, uh, what was that? What were those like, uh, home front? Well, of course, I was in college, mm -hmm. and uh, we didn't have we didn't wear uniforms at that point. We didn't get uniforms in the Navy until 1943. But mm -hmm. in 42 to 43, it was just like a regular freshman in college. Mm -hmm. uh, later on, the Army Air Force uh, put uh, their trainees into a campus at Yale. In fact, Glenn Miller and his orchestra were there oh, no, practicing. Cool. We heard them every. At lunchtime, <laughs> uh, and then they had a marine detachment and so forth later on. That comes in '43. Mm -hmm. Do you remember anything else about uh, life on the college campus during those days? Rationing or blackouts? Uh, not really. Only that that when the when the Navy took us over in '43. Then we had to do uh, athletic uh, training and mm -hmm. take special courses, took a course in uh, physics and spherical trigonometry, some of these things that the Navy required. Uh, but the, the, uh, the athletics continued, the clubs continued, mm -hmm. uh, but people were in uniform after that, 43. Okay. So then you went to Notre Dame. 1944, in the fall of Notre Dame, uh, three months. I was a 90-day wonder, they call them. Mm -hmm. In 90 days, they cranked out ensigns by the thousands, really, 
Other colleges did too, but Notre Dame is where I went. Yeah, tell us a little more about that, the 90-day wonder program. Well, the war was at a peak at that particular time, and they're trying to do as much as they could to end it. And one of the ways was to get more ships, to take more troops and supplies to the islands out in the Pacific and, and dislodge the Japanese, and also to take over areas in th that area where they could uh, send airplanes, make airports and send planes to Japan. We were getting to the point where we were just tipping the scale a little bit and getting closer to, to defeating the Japanese, but we still had uh, a lot to go. Mm -hmm. So you had, uh, even when you were in the V-12 program in Notre Dame, you had a feeling you were going to the east. I, I, we all did. Uh-huh. One of your questions was, uh, why did I join the Navy? And mm -hmm. really, as a young person at that time, unless you were physically unqualified, 4F, you either got drafted into the Army mm -hmm. or you joined the Navy or the Marines. And in my particular case, my brother had gone into the Navy and uh, most of my friends in college were, were mm -hmm. taking advantage of this V-12 program to go into the Navy. Okay. Tell us a little more about the training you had uh, during while you were at Notre Dame. Uh, <coughs> go ahead. Uh. Notre Dame, we had seamanship, we had uh, mechanical uh, courses, we mm -hmm. had signal courses, we had uh, all kinds of calisthenics we had to do to keep in condition. We had we went out on a couple of uh, cruises on on uh, Lake Michigan, and uh, we were taught by. Chiefs, Navy chiefs, and, and other mm -hmm. officers uh, in that course. Aircraft recognition, things of this kind. Mm -hmm. It was a pretty intensive course for three months. Mm. And of the training, uh, you were commissioned? End up with the Ensign's Commission, okay. which is the uh, lowest of the commissioned officers. And uh, as I say, there were just thousands of these people coming through these programs and going off. Mm -hmm. At the end of your training, you were then assigned to some other form of, of uh, service in the Navy. Mm -hmm. And those were the very best marks, usually got into destroyers. Those were sort of the average grades, like myself, I was about average, ended up in the uh, landing ships. And if your marks were pretty down low, why, you might get uh, underwater demolition or some other mm -hmm. thing of that kind. But uh, at the end of the war, I think there had been over a thousand of the LSTs, which was the type of ship that I served on, had been made in this country. Mm -hmm. And uh, a huge number of ships, really freighters, what they were. They carried mm -hmm. trucks and tanks and troops and all kinds of equipment. You mentioned huge. How huge? About the size of a football field. Wow, that's huge. And uh, the, uh, they were very flat bottom. They had, they'd draw maybe two or three feet in the bow mm -hmm. and in the stern maybe six or eight feet. And the whole idea was that to, to land troops and equipment on these islands, you had to get into the shore. So what you would do would come in at high tide, you drop a rear anchor, a stern anchor, at high tide, you go up on the beach, let everything off. And then, of course, the tide goes out and you're mm -hmm. sitting there. When the tide comes back in, you pull yourself back on this anchor and come off the beach. Mm -hmm. But it was a, a very good way of, of unloading a tremendous amount of equipment and personnel onto the beaches. Mm -hmm. And that's what they were developed for. See, most of those islands, that was the only way you could get them on there other than to, say, drop people from parachutes or something. Mm -hmm. And that, you couldn't do the numbers that way. All right, so you're a newly commissioned ensign. You mm. are assigned to an LST. Right. Tell us what happened next. Well, <clears throat> I uh, went on the LST from uh, Pittsburgh down the Mississippi River to New Orleans, where we had some more outfitting. Then we left from there to uh, go through the Panama Canal to Hawaii. And uh, at Hawaii, we then took on some more supplies and arrived in Okinawa in uh, early May of 1944. And that was the bloodiest of all of the battles in the Pacific Okinawa. Mm -hmm. The Japanese were putting up the, the greatest uh, defense that they could because mm -hmm. it was pretty evident that uh, that was their last stand. Uh, 
-hmm. So a tremendous number of casualties. Uh, they developed these kamikaze planes, which were suicide bombers, and they, in which case the pilot would dive at a target and uh, mm -hmm. kill himself. So we had to com compare with those and see what we could do with that. Okay. But it was a, it was a pretty desperate situation, but we, we did finally mm -hmm. overcome. Okay, let's uh, step away from Okinawa for a yeah. moment and back to the journey from Pittsburgh to Okinawa. Yeah. Uh, how long did it take for you to get from point to point? Well, from Pittsburgh to, to New Orleans, we stopped in Memphis, Tennessee on the way mm -hmm. down, Evansville, Indiana, where a lot of these ships were built. And I'd say it took a matter of a uh, oh, week or so, something like that, mm -hmm. as I remember it, that was many years ago. And then at New Orleans, we, had, we docked in New Orleans. We were there during Mardi Gras time, which was pretty good. Whoa. And uh, we did a little more outfitting there. Uh -huh. Great city. And what were your duties? Uh, most, I was assistant communications officer, which involved a whole lot of things, such as uh, keeping in track of the various equipment we had to send signals and so forth. But the main duty was being a member of a, a team of officers that stood watches. Mm -hmm. And your watch would last anywhere from four to six hours, and you might have two or three watches a day in team with other people. Mm -hmm. And those watches are very important because you're up there on the conning tower and you're supposed to be in charge of the entire operation for that particular time period that you're there. So you have to make sure the engines are running, you're going the right direction, mm -hmm. the right speed, that you've got lookouts posted where they need to be, uh, that uh, the people that are steering the ship are on where they're supposed to be and the right people in the radio room. Sort of a person in charge for that time period of the whole operation. Mm -hmm. The captain, of course, is in charge of the whole thing and right. you follow his orders too. Uh, you mentioned in your in summary that uh, the ship took a wrong turn off Cuba. <laughs> right, well, I made a mistake. I, I was getting used to time where instead of saying one o'clock, it's, you know, you mm -hmm. add the 12 to it and so forth. and. Uh, it didn't last long. They caught me right away. Mm -hmm. And you got a little reprimand from the captain. Oh, yeah. Oh, dear. That's right. Written or verbal? Both. Oh, dear. <laughs> well, mostly verbal, just verbal. Okay. Did you um, develop any close friendships while you were on the LST? Yes, I did. I had a very close friend from Nebraska who ended up going to graduate school at Harvard. Mm -hmm. and he, he's a well-known economist. Then another friend of mine lives in uh, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. He's uh, uh, retired also. He was mm -hmm. a full lieutenant on my ship. And uh, then we have a, a national and a local association. There's a Massachusetts LST Association and a national. Mm -hmm. And they have newsletters and stories that people can write and mm -hmm. talk about what went on. Very, very good groups. Mm -hmm. But those groups are getting smaller, of course, as time right. goes on. Now. So while you were um, on the LST heading toward Hawaii, uh, how was the, what was the best way you were getting uh, news of the world and of the war? Well, we had a radio, mm -hmm. so we get that. And uh, we get mail from time to time. I remember reading uh, Newsweek magazine used to publish a, a uh, small edition for the troops and you read that thing completely. Mm -hmm. But going back and forward, we spent a lot of time going back to the Philippines and back, and you pick up news from the people that have come from the States to the Philippines and vice versa, they pick up from you. So mm -hmm. you could find out pretty much what was going on except for the atomic bomb. That was a complete and utter right. surprise to everybody. Nobody well, we'll knew get anyone. to that. And what was, it, uh, what was it like heading from the Panama Canal to Hawaii? Well, it's just uh, a different experience. I mean, mm -hmm. so you go through the various locks. Mm -hmm. They're now expanding the Panama Canal. They're trying to increase the size of it. Mm -hmm. Some of the ships are so big now that they mm. can't fit. But uh, and the ocean voyage to Hawaii was... Pretty routine. Mm -hmm. uh, the Pacific can be very, very calm and, well, Pacific. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, it can be absolutely horrific. Right. Uh, Okay, and uh, no wrong turns or anything like that? No. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. Well, okay, now you've arrived in Hawaii. Yeah. 
And when, uh, remember when that was? Early May. Early May, back, still 44. 44, yeah. Okay. And what was Hawaii like then? Uh, 45, excuse me. Oh, um, 45. Right. Uh, what was Hawaii like? Yeah. Hawaii was just a beehive. Mm -hmm. Ships coming from all over the place, planes coming in. It was a huge staging area to go west mm -hmm. at that particular time. Right. But we weren't there very long for maybe four or five mm -hmm. days and we took off again. Okay, and now you're in Okinawa, it was May 45. Right. Were you there during the battle or after you were during there during? The battle. Oh. the battle lasted from April till June. Mm -hmm. And as I said earlier, it was one of the deadliest battles of all of the, mm. the war. And you, where, where exactly was your LST? Well, <clears throat> we were carrying pontoons, mm -hmm. steel pontoons, which were used to make bridges. Uh, and uh, so we were on the inner harbor, and one plane did get through the outside into where we were, but mm -hmm. it got shot down. But my brother was out on a perimeter. He was on a picket line, which were ships, destroyers, that were outside the harbor, and their job was to try and shoot down the kamikazes before they got into the harbor. Mm. So it's pretty tough duty. And uh, he, he'd go out there for oh, several days at a time, and he'd come in and get relieved by somebody else. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the most exciting times for me was getting to see him. I, f I found out his ship was there, and we spent a, an evening together on his ship. Uh, I hadn't seen him for a couple of years mm -hmm. at that particular time. But that was quite an experience at, at night to see those, those kamikazes come down. They'd be shot down, and it looked like a firefly. Just out in the space, you'd see this light coming down and two or three of them, mm -hmm. the ones that didn't make it, and uh, otherwise they'd have come in and got the ships and, and the troops mm -hmm. that were in on the harbor, which was mm -hmm. what they're after. Well, a wild way to have a reunion. Yeah. Mm. Anything else about Okinawa? No, only that it's now Japanese again. <laughs> uh, no, only that it was a, it was a, it was a, the, the civilians in Okinawa were mm -hmm. used by the Japanese in a pretty cruel way. They, they, mm. they uh, were right on the front lines and uh, mm -hmm. you know, many, many of the casualties were Okinawans, just right. natives who were, happened to be in the wrong place. Okay. Uh, did you act, were actually on the island or were you always we were on the island? Our ship was out, was in the harbor. Mm -hmm. right. We didn't go, in, didn't go in the harbor. No. Mm -hmm. But never on the island itself. But you saw a great deal. Yeah. Well, they, they, they were in caves. The Japanese were in caves. Mm -hmm. and the, the destroyers and ships like my brothers would shoot into the caves to try and <coughs> get them out. Mm -hmm. Pretty hard, but they, they finally did. Right. So tell us what happened after Okinawa. Well, then in August of that year, as I said earlier, we, we got this word that the, that the war was over. Mm-hmm and uh, that the atomic bomb had been dropped, but we didn't know what the atomic bomb was. No, right. None of us knew what it was or, or why, the, why it had been so successful. Uh -huh. So later on, we learned how powerful it was and how mm -hmm. much damage it had done. Mm -hmm. But I was reading something the other day. It said that, that our bombing, our normal bombing, which was taking place in the Japanese homeland, was almost at a point where it was going to defeat the Japanese anyway. Mm. The bomb just was a final stage mm -hmm. of it. Once they got that, then there's, there's no mm -hmm. way to continue. So where were you when you heard that the... I was the on the way from the Philippine Islands back to Okinawa <coughs> with some troops that were coming back, were taking them. Okay. Talk about um, your time in the Philippines. Well, uh, Philippines was very friendly to the U.S., of course, mm -hmm. and they'd been occupied by Japan, so they were very happy to have us there. But it was a big staging area. That was the main staging area for going uh, further uh, to Japan, mm -hmm. that and, and the island of Guam, which is a little further east of. Mm -hmm. of uh, okay, at this stage, this is the war had been declared over, the A bomb's been dropped. Uh, what was your rank? I was still an ensign. Still I would have probably made a lieutenant junior grade at the end mm -hmm. if I'd stayed in. But our job after that was to transport troops back from say Okinawa and other places back to the Philippines for perhaps transfer home mm -hmm. and then also to take 
prisoners from Japan, uh, Jap Japanese prisoners from South Indochina back up to Japan and then mm -hmm. take Chinese soldiers back to Manchuria. So we were mostly troop, troop carriers at that point. Mm -hmm. Did you ever encounter the uh, Japanese POWs or the Chinese troops? Yeah, yeah, they were on the ship. They, mm -hmm. they didn't cause any trouble. They, mm -hmm. I suppose they're glad to get home. Right. Uh, what about the Chinese troops? No, they're pretty well disciplined. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, I can't mm -hmm. say much more about them. I mean, all of my only contact with them was to see them loaded onto the ship and unloaded when they got off. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any contact with them. Okay. They were taken care of by their own officers and so mm -hmm. forth. But, uh, so tell us what happened after. Well, then, of course, uh, we ended up in Shanghai and uh, waiting there for further instructions of what to do, whether to carry any more of these people back and forth. And we were getting uh, points for the number of months mm -hmm. that you served in the service. And as your points increased, then you got to the point where you could be discharged. And my points came up while I was at, uh, in Shanghai. And so I then uh, was put on a troop ship that went the Great Circle route. It went from Shanghai across to San Francisco and uh, took almost a while almost two weeks to get there, mm -hmm. and then I was home. I've been hearing from other veterans about when they saw the Golden Gate. Oh, unbelievable, mm -hmm. unbelievable. It just, uh, it's not only a great sight to see it, but what it represented. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's one thing to come into an island or something else like that and over there, and, and mm -hmm. it meant nothing really to you, but to see that and to know that you were actually home. Right. That and a uh, glass of milk. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you get home, by the way? Uh, train. I took, I took a train from uh, <clears throat> California. We went down through uh, Texas and came up to Boston. And then I uh, took a train from Boston out to mm -hmm. Lincoln, where I lived at the time. Okay. Lincoln. A little bit more about life on board the, the LST. You were mentioning uh, getting milk in San Francisco and stuff. What was the, uh, the food like? I thought it was good. I, I never had any problem with it. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it uh, we had cooks and bakers like you'd have anywhere else. Our crew, total crew was about 100. Mm -hmm. Of those, 90 were enlisted men and 10 were officers. And we also had a uh, staff of, of uh, a uh, Commodore group. It was uh, higher ups that were on our ship too. But uh, we had our own, the officers were treated very well. We had our own wardroom and, and mm -hmm. cooks and bakers for us too. I didn't complain. I think the only complaint usually was you get the same stuff. Mm. There's not that much variety and that mm -hmm. was, a, some people couldn't care for that. But. Right, and what about uh, medical care? Uh, I had no problem with it. Uh, at the very end we had a doctor on our ship mm -hmm. so that he was, Available, but uh, we had no uh, no no problems. Mm -hmm. Very lucky. What about recreation? Well, we had uh, table tennis. We had boxing matches. We had probably the best basketball team, and I'm I'm mm. really mean this seriously. Mm -hmm. In the, in the South Pacific, be, be, once your tank deck is open, you've got a basketball court. Ah, it's empty. So we rigged up baskets, and when we come into a port, we'd call other ships to see if they want to play us. And we had a record of something like 25 and 2. We were very, very good. We had a lot of boys mm -hmm. from the Midwest. They were very good players. And uh, we had a uh, referee with a fellow named Eddie Gologli from Providence, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. He was a former lieutenant governor down there, and he, he would uh, referee the games. And it was a real professional setup. Mm -hmm. And I guess just because of our ability, why we got to the point where pretty hard to get anywhere to beat us. <laughs> good. But that was a big, big thing. But we went swimming. If we had a mm -hmm. place where we could, uh, you know, drop the anchor and go swimming, you could do that. Right. Uh, but it was uh, mm -hmm. wasn't wasn't an awful lot of recreation. The main thing was doing a duty, keeping your watch, and sleeping, sleep and eat. Mm -hmm. And overall, what do you think about the, the overall leadership? 
My what? Your, the leadership, your, your commanding officer. Good, they were fine. Good? Very good. Okay. We had an interesting situation. One of your questions mm -hmm. was a humorous situation. Mm -hmm. We had a, a captain uh, who was a Mustang. He'd come up through the ranks. He was a full lieutenant from down south. And then we also had a doctor on the ship. I mentioned that. And the doctor was, uh, and the, the captain just were like that. They, they didn't get along at all, just different worlds completely. And this doctor went ashore in Shanghai and uh, spent quite a while at several bars, I guess. He came back to the ship late at night. It's a great big piece of wood. And he called the, the captain out to, to see him. He says, Captain, he says, I found your ship's log. And here he gave him this great big piece of wood. I mean, the, uh, it, to me it was humorous. And a lot of people are not so sure how funny it was. But the log is a big thing for the captain. You've got to write mm -hmm. everything down every day. Mm -hmm. And this doctor just couldn't stand him. So he gave him a piece of wood. That was it. Oh, dear. <laughs> All right, let's get you back to Lexington. The war is over. What happened next? Well, I got married. I got married, I got home in, in uh, must have been the first part of June, got married the 27th of June. I'd been engaged for a couple of years, I guess, mm -hmm. year and a half. And her name? Her name was Bessie Amadon, came from Vermont. She died in 1978, and I remarried in 1980 to a girl named Mary Hudner, whose brother, Tom, is the Congressional mm -hmm. Medal of Honor mm -hmm. recipient from, uh, he lives in Concord too. Yeah, yeah, he's one of our interviews too. Is he really? Yeah. Good. Great guy, very mm -hmm. nice fellow, yeah. Okay, you got married, uh, what did you do for a career? Well, I went into business with my father <coughs> in mm -hmm. the life insurance business with a company from Philadelphia, Provident Mutual, which has been taken over by Nationwide. Mm -hmm. I was there for uh, about, 10 or 15 years or so. Then I went to the Lay Clinic and worked in uh, community relations and fundraising. Then I went to the Clinton Hospital, the Santa Maria Hospital in Cambridge. And in 1986, I joined Old Sturbridge Village. And I'm still there. Mm -hmm. And you are a, a reenactor, an interpreter? I have a costume. I make I'm the head broom maker out there. I drive the boat. We have a boat that goes up the river. Wow. I, uh, the minister, mm -hmm. uh, school teacher. Uh, all sorts keeper. of stuff. <laughs> we all have different roles. Mm -hmm. I don't work in the winter, just in the summertime. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, did you, after the war, did you join any military organizations? Just or? the, uh, the LST associations that mm -hmm. I mentioned before. I support the VFW. Mm -hmm. Financially, small way, but I haven't been active otherwise. Mm -hmm. How important was it for you to serve in the military? Well, I didn't think too much about, about it. I mean, everybody was in it that I knew. All of my friends were in it. Mm -hmm. They were joining. They had to either they were either drafted or they joined the Navy or the Marines. Mm -hmm. uh, I was convinced that that you know we had to defeat the Japanese, mm -hmm. and my brother Alec, as I say, had been involved at Pearl Harbor, so I felt that was important. And um, as far as your brother, did he talk about his experiences? No. 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 Mm. Okay. Is there anything else you would like to say? Well, one of the questions you asked was a memorable experiences. Mm -hmm. And the, there are several, but the one that sticks with me the most is going through a typhoon, mm -hmm. which is an unbelievable situation. It's like a hurricane at sea. The winds are that, that high, and mm -hmm. the waves are 40, 50, 60 feet. Mm -hmm. And it's as, as close to being out of this world, as you can imagine, you just you'd have to be there to actually go through mm -hmm. it. Now, uh, and, uh, when did you experience the typhoon? Well, that was going from uh, Okinawa to the Philippine Islands, mm -hmm. and uh, one of my <clears throat> friends from Evansville, Indiana, sent me a T-shirt with a picture of an LST on it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and on the back of the shirt, there's a statement, 
And a statement says, let he who knows not how to pray go to see. Mm. And it's true. Mm -hmm. we, we, had, we had the biggest guy on our ship, a fellow from Indiana. We tied him to the wheel. He was huge, big guy, to keep that, the ship going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. If you go sideways, like the, pres the, the perfect storm, you roll over and you're gone. Mm -hmm. So you keep going straight. And we had that kind of a thing going. And you, you just, you don't have time to think. You're just, mm -hmm. you're at the mercy of right. whatever. And how long did the storm last? Oh, it lasted for several hours. Mm -hmm. And then you have rough seas after that that go on for weeks sometimes. Mm -hmm. But that, that was a personal thing. I, I think most of the people who went through it would recognize that. Mm -hmm. uh, Thurston, anything else? No. I. Happy to participate in your group, mm -hmm. and I'll tell Mackenzie that I showed up. And, <laughs> yeah. Well, Mackenzie will get to see more than say, yeah, hey, okay. my grandfather showed up. Well, Thurston Hammer, thank you so much You're for take, coming and taking part in the Native Veterans yeah. Oral History Club. Thank you, Maureen. Okay. Thank you. Okay.